Wow. What happened, he took the school. You might have heard about the school on CNN. It was a bad racial issue up there. Yeah. And he was a I met him after the UI. And um what for me high school. Then it became the principal. So he brought us in there and you know I had a class in there at seven thirty in the morning. Our program became the home homeroom for a lot of the knucklehead kids. Uh and then the work that took place at the school, I think we wound up driving from 1,100, 1,300 referrals to like 100, 600 referrals, 500 drop. So when the compliance people came in, Heidi, who just so happened to be from uptown, who out told me. Jackson from Praises in the Midday um, on Praise 104.9. Um, but yeah, my story didn't always start there. Um, as this uh, evangelist on the radio, uh, my, my history with my brother, Pastor CJ, goes back way beyond 30 years. Um, and God is so amazing how he does things full circle because growing up, I grew up in uptown, northwest D.C., probably a block away from where Rayford Evans was found and um, found myself in a relationship with a kingpin and C.J. worked for my king, that boyfriend that I had. is how I, my kingpin, how I, <laughs> how I met him. He was actually like eight or nine back then. And then fast forward into my career in radio, I ended up programming Heaven 1580 and we brought in this young guy who was coming in doing what they call hood invasions, going into the projects and setting up and feeding the hungry and coaling them and um, playing gospel go go bands and that kind of thing. And he's in this chair and he started talking about his history and I said, wait a minute, where did you grow up? And when he said he grew up on uh, Fifth and Kennedy, I said, wait a minute, you ain't no little CJ that we used to run, and then, so God made it full circle, because by this time he was saved, and I was saved, and so we're making a difference, and I hired him, and he became, you know, a job on a radio station, and just doing amazing things, and we've been joined to the hip, um, you know, ever since. Um, I'm also, I'm a mom of four kids, two bonus babies, the oldest is 28, and the, uh, my middle kid is 25, um, I have a 20-year-old daughter, uh, who's a miracle. change from the time I was a patrolman before any of the technology that you are aware of today. Probably everybody has a cell phone. When I started policing, there weren't even pagers, right? The telephone was on your wall in your kitchen. That had that long spot. If you was fortunate, you could go out and get that extra long cord so you could go around the corner and sit with your feet up against the wall. And you could dial the phone. And if you had to call 911, it's going to take a minute. You know what I'm saying? So young people just, just I was going to say, Encyclopedia, but I'm telling you, Google it. You can see the old phones. You can, you can see the old phones. And so when I started policing, there was something we had when I was coming up, what I was exposed to even before I came to the police. We had relational equity in our communities. In other words, the police that came in our community they were part of our community. They were family. We were having a cookout, they came over, they grabbed the burger. We got in trouble, it wasn't a quick arrest. What are you doing? Take you home. They had a, listen, they were disciplined us without taking us to jail. It was way different back then, but that just wasn't a police community relationship. That was the entire relationship between the entire community because the community disciplined and raised its own kids. They didn't call the police to come get their kids. And so what I wanted to do when technology came in, it took that personal touch away from us. Like most of y'all probably did through the internet and Facebook, Snapchat, I don't do none of that. I got my wife the old fashioned way, went to church, but I'm gonna leave that alone. I'm gonna leave that alone. 
But what I'm saying to you is, times have so much changed that we don't know how to engage one another. And I realized as I became a commander, and I'm going to turn this over, that my police were now coming from the same gene pool, Generation X, yeah. the next generation. And they didn't have that, they didn't have that social ability to also engage the community because they were raised in their bedrooms, go to your home, playing on Nintendo and their PlayStation, God knows what you got now, doing that. Where I was raised, get outside and stay outside and play with your friends. Yeah. And so times will change. And so now I had to teach my officers who were fearful of how to talk to people they didn't know. Because they didn't have that skill set. On top of that, when I was raised in the police department, we all came from Baltimore. Let me say this, the best person to, commit to police any community is someone who was raised in the community. But today they come from all over the country and all over the world and often they don't understand the culture of that community and they're fearful of the community. Does that make sense to you? So my job was to train them, retrain them. So I'll just shut up with this, that literally when I finally was able to galvanize the entire community and take the worst district, we saw a 40 year crime though because we taught the community it's not just for you police, us police to take care of that situation, we all in this together. And we talked about police to stop abusing the community, stop slamming down the kids on the street, stop pulling down their pants, because now you got a major to deal with. I'm going to put my foot so far up your behind that you got to deal with me. Yes, sir. And so you're going to deal with so seeing that our African Americans are struggling in schools. Yeah. So layoffs came around. I told them to lay me off. I took a seventy thousand dollar pay cut to go to education. And now I found my purpose. I am living yeah. my purpose. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, at the time. One of the I would say the reason why I'm so passionate about it is because this is my philosophy on it. This is what I've done in my school. When I took over the school, my school was on CNN the year before I took it over. Big racial, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 Caucasian boy, have, uh, wrote a satire paper about African Americans, and that, that paper hit the news the year before I got there, the year before CJ and I got there. It hit the news. Uh, and they bring, they bring it in. But my philosophy is this, parents, you can listen to this, and kids, you can listen to this too. That, you know, within our systems, I had to go in and change the adults. Mm. We always look at changing the kids. That's good. But adults, kids don't, can't control the system. The adults control the system. The only reason why students are chaotic is because they don't have a system to follow. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you gotta, we got to understand this. Our kids are out of control at schools because they don't have a standard. They go to this teacher, this teacher tries to do anything. They go to this teacher, this teacher tries to be strict. So what happens is the students wind up creating their own standard because they don't know who to follow because they're sending mixed messages. So the first thing that I did was create a system for adults. Who are we to judge when we done sold a lot of dope and we ain't done everything right? Like when you was 15, you wasn't acting like you was 50. So it's wrong for us to put that type of pressure on a 15 year old if we're not gonna read that record. So I'm tired of hearing people talk about anything and they're not doing nothing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What's that, Biggs? You know how you so y'all look at SOS, man. Y'all see we got these dates on the calendar. Uh, but this is what I really want to speak to. And I'm done for real. Make sure I get out of here. Um, you said a lot of stuff about boys and what we do with young men and all the services we have and the redirection. And most of these testimonies are from people who had sons. But you know and understand that the fastest growing prison population in America right now are young black women. Hello? Yeah. Young girls. Yeah. I said the fastest growing prison population in America 
these young girls. The majority of fight videos that you see on Instagram or that you see on the internet are girls. Girls are rumbling. Girls are rumbling. You got girls that would rather be Lil Wayne than Lil Kim. That went over your head, let me say that again. There are girls, young girls, that would rather be Lil Wayne 